Well, good morning. If you would please open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. We'll be happy to know that we'll actually be finishing chapter 1 today. John chapter 1. Beloved, I want us to uh, think back. Uh, some of us, we've got to think a little bit further than some others, but we need to think back to where you were 10 years old. Most of you probably attended public school like I did. Do you remember PE class? Do you remember specifically when the PE teacher chose two captains? Oh, painful memories. I, I can hear the groaning. And they were to choose teams. They were to pick teams. And then you sat there wondering when and if you were going to get picked to be on the team. And as I was thinking about this, I was uh, trying to remember, how is it? What was the criteria for these team captains to pick their, their team members? What was the criteria? Well, depend on the sport. Height probably was, was a, a good one. Strength, speed, agility. Or if we're honest, the big one, popularity. It didn't matter. It's just if you're popular, you're, you're sure we're not going to be picked last. And uh, I, I have a little smiley face in my notes here. It says, okay, time to be honest. How many of you were chosen last? I sure did, especially when it came to uh, basketball and volleyball. I don't know why, but now, although, although it is absolutely wrong and terribly sexist, gentlemen, you know that if a girl was picked before you on any sport, you were really, really bad. Now, I must admit that many girls were picked before I was when it came to basketball and volleyball. Uh, you know why? Because most girls were taller than me, and most girls are still taller than me even now, so you probably wouldn't pick me to play volleyball or basketball. Um, but when it came to picking team members for the Spanish class project, <laughs> guess who was picked first? That's right, this short Mexican kid with glasses who was picked last for all tall people sports. And as you can tell, I'm almost over it. Almost over it. Now, when it comes to picking people to be on a team, uh, you know who the ultimate team captain is, right? Is of course, is Christ Jesus. Now, when it was time for him to begin his ministry, he set out to build a team. Specifically, a team of 12 men. And thus far in our study of the Gospel of John, we, have, we are told that Jesus has thus far gained three disciples. Andrew, John the Evangelist, who doesn't name himself, and Peter, Andrew's brother. Now, as we move on to our study this morning, we will find that Jesus gains two more disciples. Here in verses 43 through 51, which is our text for today, he will gain a disciple by the name of Philip and another disciple by the name of Nathaniel, who is also known as Bartholomew in order in the other Gospels. And as we look at these two of Jesus' disciples, I want us to consider certain characteristics of a disciple of Christ that are set forth by Philip and Nathaniel. And as we look at these, how these men were called by Jesus, we will get a little glimpse of how the team captain, how Christ chose his team. So let us read our text for this morning, shall we? Beginning in verse 43 of John chapter 1. 
And John, the apostle, continues by saying that the next day, he, meaning Jesus, purposed to go into Galilee, and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida of the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered, said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. And we thank you for this witness of John the Apostle. We thank you for the example that you've given us and how you called Philip and Nathaniel and Lord as we uh, learn from their example, see what you saw in them, how you called them. Lord, we pray that uh, these truths would be of this, uh, of true of us as well. So far, go before us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. That was this morning, I want us to look at four characteristics of Christian disciples, that is, followers as manifested by Philip and Nathaniel, looking to them as our examples. And the first I suggest to you, as we find in verses 43 and 44, and it is that a true Christian disciple, characteristic number one of such a one, is they are sought out by Christ. So a person who is a Christian disciple of Christ is first and foremost sought out by Christ. Notice that John the Apostle says that the next day, he, notice that there's a capital H. It's interesting because some commentators actually believe that the Greek, well, the Greek could be pointing back to uh, um, Andrew. But apparently most Bible translators believe that John is not referring to Andrew who went to seek out Philip, but in fact Christ. That the next day, he, capital H-E, Christ, purposed to go out, in, to go into Galilee, and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Now, to purpose. This word means to desire. To have something. To have something that you have in mind for yourself. It speaks of purpose and resolve. Now, some might say, preacher, you're making a big deal about this word decided. That's all basically Jesus did. He just decided to go out. And he accidentally found Philip. Well, I may be wrong, loved ones, but I don't think anything that Jesus does is by accident. There's no accident with him. He purposed to go out to Galilee. And as he got into Galilee... He found Philip, not by accident, but I suggest to you, loved ones, that he went out purposefully. It was time to begin to build, to continue to build his team. Therefore, John tells us that after Andrew, John, and Peter began to follow Christ the next day, Jesus purposely set out, he decided purposely to go out to find his next disciple. And in verse 43b, he found Philip, and he's told Philip, follow me. Now, loved ones, I need you to note something. And, and this is by way of a question. Let me ask you, who found who? Who found who? You know, it's interesting because no one ever finds Christ. You know why they never find Christ? Because Christ has never been lost. People are lost. And therefore, the question 
stance. Who finds who? It is Jesus who finds the lost as he found Philip. He sought him out and he found him. We don't read that Philip was wandering about Galilee looking for this Messiah, this Christ. No, it was Jesus who purposely set out to go look and find Philip. Now, what about this Philip character? Verse 44 tells us that Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. The name Bethsaida means house of fishing. House of fishing. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, they were probably friends, was a Galilean and most likely a fisherman. So it's interesting. We have Andrew and Peter, and now Philip, who are all from Bethsaida, were born there. For we know that Andrew and Peter actually had a home in Capernaum, so that's way south. But they were from here. This was their hometown. And this was a fishing town. So we have Andrew, Peter, and now Philip, whom Jesus calls to, to follow him. And these are Fishermen. So here's the question. So why would Jesus pick fishermen as his first disciples on his team? Why did they get picked? Well, some uh, believe that it was because of their worth ethic. Worth ethic. Fishermen are not lazy. If they were, they would starve. Uh, fishermen uh, would understand the analogy of becoming fishers of men, as later Jesus would would instruct them. But most probably. Jesus chose fishermen because of their low, lower social status. They were not among the elite. They were hard-working, let's just say, blue-collar men. Now, this was very important for Jesus. Whereas many would think that the Messiah would come to earth and, and, and pick his dream team, get the best of the best. Don't get these people from small fishing villages. Get them from Jerusalem. Go to the temple. Find out who are the smartest, the brightest of the Sanhedrin and begin to pick them to be on your team. But no, to pick those who are among the most lowly was very important for Jesus as it was for God, his father, when he chose Israel, insignificant Israel, to be his chosen nation. And, and we've got to stop and think about it. Why did God choose Israel? Well, let me read to you out of Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 and 7, where Moses says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Verse 7 says, The Lord did not set his love on you, nor chose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. You know, if God was going to pick a dream team, a mighty nation, I would suggest you, to you that he would have picked Egypt. They, they, were, they, they had chariots and, 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 and horses, and they were very wealthy, and they were very lear learned. They had one of the most wonderful libraries in that time. But God chose insignificant Israel, the least of the least. So Christ did not set out to choose the mightiest, the smartest, the richest, nor the most influential. Again, he would have picked from the elite in Jerusalem, not men from a lowly fishing village in Galilee, not at all. Therefore, we see that Christ the one who chooses to, the, who he would choose, the one who chooses to follow him, has been sought out and found by Christ himself for his glory, not from the elite. Now, by way of application, and forgive me if it's too early for that, but just stop and think about it. Aren't you glad? I know I am. Aren't you glad that Christ does not choose from his follow for his followers? from only the elite. Some of you may have been chosen, but I surely would have not, So I'm just not in those elite circles. What could I bring to Christ but my miserable sin 
But thank God that he chooses from the lowly. You wouldn't think that he would have chosen these men first. But praise God that he did. You know, it reminds me of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 and 29, where he says, For consider your calling, brethren, that there, are, there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the, that, and the despised of God has chosen the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. That's another reason why I suggest to you Christ chose of these lowly fishermen. What could they boast of? Not very much. Now, not only are Christ's followers sought out by Christ, they didn't seek Christ out, but they are sought out by Christ. But the second characteristic of, of Christian disciples is that, if you'll notice in verses 45 and 46, is that they look to tell others about Christ and invite them to seek Christ. This is how you can tell a true disciple of Christ, is one who seeks to tell others about Christ and invites them to seek Christ for themselves. Notice what it says in verse 45. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the, and the law, also the prophets, wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, He invited him, Come and see. You know, as Andrew brought Simon to Peter, so Philip here found Nathanael. And witnessed to him. Now, D.A. Carson is correct then when he says that this is the foundational principle of truly Christian expansion ever since. New followers of Jesus bear witness of him to others who in turn become disciples and repeat the process. If you think about it, beloved, that's how you and I came to know the Lord. A disciple, a follower of Christ, shared Christ with us. And through that call, we became disciples ourselves, and hopefully we go out and do the same, repeating the process many times over. Now notice that Philip found Nathaniel, and he witnessed to him. And notice that he used the Old Testament to witness to him, or what we consider the Old Testament. To him, it was just the scriptures, by saying, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, given that Philip pointed to Moses and the law as he witnessed to uh, Nathaniel, commentators believe that Nathaniel may have been a student of the Old Testament or the student of the, or the word or the student of the law in his time. And as uh, Cruz says, that Philip's reference to the one Moses wrote about in the law is an illusion to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18, where the Lord says to Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will lead and he will tell them everything I command him. So surely this would have intrigued Nathaniel. You, you mean, Philip, that you, you, you found this, this very, the very person that Moses talked about? that the prophets, prophets spoke about? Again, this would intrigue Nathaniel, but then Philip adds, yes, yes, we found him. In fact, it is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now to this, notice how Nathaniel responds in verse 46. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And you could just imagine, Nathaniel is following. It's like, you found him? The, the one that Moses spoke about, the prophets spoke about? I'm following Philip, I'm interested, but wait a second, what, excuse, what did you just say? Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph? Nathanael was from Cana. We'll read this in chapter 21, verse 2, which is another town in Galilee. 
And as Galileans were frequently despised by people from Judea, from the south, you know, the northerners, they're backwards. As Galileans were frequently despised by people from Judea, so it appears that even fellow Galileans despise those from Nazareth. Again, according to Cruz, Nazareth was such an insignificant place and one that appears to know if in none of the prophecies concerning the Messiah. So Nathaniel was not willing to accept Philip's testimony. It's like, what are you talking about? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? No prophet has ever said anything concerning a, 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 anything good coming out of Nazareth. Now, should this surprise us? No. Nathaniel was simply being honest. Yet, we must realize that from John's perspective, the fact that Jesus was reared in Nazareth reflected the self-abasement of the man from heaven. It's not by accident, beloved. Yeah, Jesus was born in Bethlehem near Jerusalem. But he was reared in Nazareth from where nothing good comes. Even the lowly Galileans look at the Nazareans as even lower than them in class. So here we have those in a small fishing village in, 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 in Bethsaida looking down upon, oh, those from Nazareth. Nothing good comes out of there. Thou should not, should not surprise us, beloved, that our Lord said, yep, I came from there. He was known as Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus of Nazarene. Not Jesus from Bethlehem with all the royal or Davidic overtones that would have provided, says Carson. He was from Nazareth. I also like what uh, commentator Mills points out in that Nathaniel's question also serves the purpose of indicating the despised status of the city which Jesus chose as his earthly home. Truly, in Jesus' choice of poverty-stricken parents and his choice of a despised town as his home, he made it possible for all mankind to identify with him. And you could just imagine, you come from a small town, insignificant town, you rejoice for Jesus came from the same place. Significantly, from a small, insignificant place, despised place. Isn't it wonderful that that's what Jesus chose uh, as a city so that he would identify with the lowest of the low, the poorest, the sickest. This is so like Christ, is it not? He didn't want to be seen or known as one of great social prominence. He came to die as a criminal, not to live as a king on the earth, at least not yet. That is yet to come. So how does Philip respond to his doubting friend? By simply inviting him to check out the claim for himself. What Andrew said earlier to Simon Peter, Philip now says to Nathaniel, come and see. He didn't debate. He didn't say, Nathaniel, how rude. We have friends in Nazareth. How rude. He just says, come and see. Come and check it out for yourself. See, a true disciple of Christ witnesses and invites the people, invites the person who, you, who you're witnessing to, to go, go check it out for yourself. Go read the testimony in Scripture. Don't just take my word for it. You go check it out for yourself. What a glorious invitation. Now, beloved, when people reject our witness, all we can do is invite them to consider the facts for themselves as we invite them to, for them to seek Christ for themselves. That's all we can do. So Nathaniel heeds Philip, Philip's uh, request, and notice what we read in verses 47 and 49 where we now see the third characteristic of a Christian of, of, of Christian disciples in the example of Nathaniel. And that is, number three, they are pre-known by Christ so that they may be known, so that they may know Christ. They are pre-known by Christ so that they may know Christ. 
Notice verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Or some of your translations may read, There's no guile in him. Now Jesus was saying that Nathanael was the ideal Israelite because guile or deceit was not found in him or guile had not gone out of his life. Nathanael was evidently an Old Testament believer, as we would call him, like Simeon and Anna, who was looking for God. They were, they were searching for the fulfillment of the scriptures. The Lord knew Nathanael's character before he even met him. In this respect, Nathanael is different from the father of all Israelites, Jacob, who used guile, who used deception to take his brother's blessing in Genesis chapter 27, verse 35. Now, you may be seeing, preacher, where did you get that? Well, we will read, when we get to verse 51, you'll see that contextually. This is the very thing that Jesus is referring to when he is speaking to and addressing Nathanael. But for now, the important thing is that Christ, before meeting Nathanael, knew Nathanael. Oh, there you go, you Calvinistic reform guys. Always looking for election in every text. Beloved, Jesus knew Nathaniel before Nathaniel even knew him. And I'm suggesting to you that the only reason Nathaniel got to know Christ is because Christ knew Nathaniel first. He knew Nathaniel first. And Nathaniel, verse 48, said to Jesus, how do you know me? Nathaniel realized, how do, you, how do you know me? Now, it is not that Nathaniel's brag, yes, Lord, you are right. There is no guile. There is no deceiving me. I am indeed a true Israel. No. But Christ knew Nathaniel's heart. He knew his character. So Nathaniel surprised how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, Nathaniel, before he called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. I know who you are, Nathaniel, Jesus could be saying. Yes, when you thought you, have, you were by yourself under that fig tree, you weren't. I saw you. So here's the question. What was Nathaniel doing under that fig tree? Why, is what, why was Nathaniel so surprised to hear Jesus say what he said? Now again, interestingly, commentators state that for Jewish scholars, to sit under a fig tree was indicative of being students of the law. Jewish scholars sat under fig trees to study the law. Probably because they provided much shade. I don't know exactly. Now, this phrase is used in, in rabbinic literature to describe meditation of the law. So apparently, if you were going to be a one to meditate upon the law, the place to do it is under a fig tree. Go figure. I'm, I'm not entirely sure why. Probably because they're strong and they provide much shade. Now, whatever Nathaniel's experience under that fig tree involved, it must have been significant for him. Maybe Nathaniel had been reading the story of Jacob's ladder. Maybe he was thinking about the Messiah. Maybe he had prayed that the Messiah would reveal him, himself to, 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 to Israel soon. Whatever it was, one thing is for certain. Nathaniel had a spiritual experience under that fig tree. And it was very powerful. Jesus was saying, in essence, I know about the experience you had under that fig tree, Nathaniel, as you were reading. When you thought that you were only talking to God, Jesus says, Nathaniel, I saw you. Now, regardless of what it was, what is important is that Nathaniel had a religious experience that no one, that no one but Jesus 
but no one but God knew about. And here Jesus says, I saw you. That, that is big. How big? Well, this, notice how big. Verse 49, notice his response. And Nathanael answered, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Here Nathanael prescribes tremendous respect to Christ as master teacher, Rabbi. But also addresses Christ as the King of Israel. Simply because Jesus says, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Whatever that experience that Nathaniel had under that fig tree, by himself and God, Nathaniel realized who was in his presence. It's like, it was only God and me under that tree. And Jesus says, I saw you. No wonder that Nathaniel says, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Again, here Nathaniel prescribed tremendous respect as a teacher and as a king of Israel, ruler of Israel, as the one prophesied to sit upon David's throne. May I say then that the reason Nathaniel knew who Christ was is because Christ knew Nathaniel first. My loved ones, there's no way that anyone not pre-known by Christ, will ever know Christ truly. The only reason we could ever get to a place where we can have a biblical saving knowledge of Christ is because He knew us first and therefore called us to Himself. Which leads us to the last of the characteristics of Christian disciples, and that is in verse 50 and 51, that they are given the privilege of greater biblical understanding. One of the characteristics, wonderful characteristics of Christian disciples is that to them, is that to us, is given the privilege of greater biblical understanding. Notice verse 50. Jesus answered and sent to him, to Nathanael, because I say to you, because I said to you that I saw you under a fig tree, do you believe? And in essence, Jesus say, Nathaniel, you have seen nothing yet. You will see greater things than thee. Now here Jesus promises Nathaniel that regardless of the present importance of this display of supernatural knowledge, which he, he proved, Jesus says that he will see greater things than that. And as we look at verse 50, he's speaking about including the signs reported in this gospel, the first of which is about to unfold as we pick it up next week when we look at his first uh, miracle in the, wed the wedding of Canaan. So, what are these greater things? Notice verse 51. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, before we get this, please pay, pay very close attention to these words. Truly, truly. Jesus uses it before an utterance to conform or to confirm and emphasize the trustworthiness and importance of what he's about to say. This is the first time, but not the last time, in the Gospel of John that you will see these words, truly, truly. Truly, when we see these words, our ears are to perk up and we need to sit up and pay attention because what follows after those two words is very, very important. In the synopsis, that is Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke, the expression always occurs sing, uh, 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 singly or in, in singularly. In John, it's always doubled. And how does a biblical writer uh, 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 emphasize something? You repeat it. So here John the Apostle is, is emphasizing by repeating what Jesus is saying. Jesus is emphasizing himself, what he's about to say. Truly, truly. Very, very important. Now here Jesus introduced the explanation of the greater things. Which, with the formula, I tell you the truth. And notice what he, Nathaniel received. He 
as a disciple, as one who has been known of Christ and therefore can know Christ, is now given access to spiritual things, spiritual realities. Truly, truly, I say to you, we'll see the heavens open and the angels of God descend, ascending and descending on the Son of God. Now here, clearly, Christ is making an allusion to Jacob. After Jacob, that scoundrel, stole his brother's birthright, and he began to fear his brother Esau, he fled. Now, he was absolutely wrong. But remember, God made a promise to his father, Abraham and Isaac, and, now, and later to Jacob, that he, he won't forsake them and promise them a, a great, great uh, uh, inheritance of land and of, and of uh, uh, seed in terms of children. So here the illusion go, takes us back to that time where Jacob had a dream. Where he saw this ladder coming out of heaven. On the top of his ladder was the Lord. And he saw ministering spirits, angels coming up and down. And basically, God blessed Jacob with this, with this dream. As Jacob was in tremendous distress. So, so weary, so tired that he actually fluffed, fluffed, fluffed up a little stone. And use it as a pillow. But in that dream, God, God reminded Jacob, I am not done with you. I'm not done with this promise. And God, the Lord there's, is continually ministering. There's, there's access. I haven't forgotten you. So Christ to Nathaniel says, listen. Some of these greater things that... As you as a disciple, as a follower of me, that you're going to see, you're going to have greater understanding of what these things are or what these things point to. In verse 12 of Genesis 28, while Jacob slept, God com com uh, confronted him or comforted him in a dream where upon a ladder God ministering angels were going up and down between God and the earth. Meaning that God had not abandoned Jacob. God, through his ministering servants, was taking care of things on earth. Now in verse 51, in of our text, Christ made not only Nathaniel, but whoever else was listening. This is very important. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, that you is now plural. It's no longer singular. So he is not speaking only to Nathaniel, but to everybody that may be listening. It could be Philip. Could be other people who are just listening. It's it's us. Okay, it's plural, not only Nathaniel, but you plural. I say to you, to you all. You all will see the heavens open and the angels of God descend ascending and ascending upon the Son of uh, the Son of God. So here we, we realize what Christ is telling Nathaniel that you're going to see greater things as a follower of me. That which were shadows in the Old Testament are become realities now in me, in the person of Christ. And here's, here's the revelation. You know the ladder that Jacob dreamt? Christ is that ladder. Christ is that connection now before God the Father and the earth. Jacob didn't know. But to Nathaniel and to all those who have been called to follow Christ, such revelation is made. Christ is the ladder. For it is upon Christ that God's ministering angels, God's care for, for the earth, God's care for us, are going up and going down on the Son of God, Son of Man, on Christ. Christ is the ladder. What in Revelation to Nathaniel and the rest of us who follow Christ. He gave a promise of growth. We will experience ongoing growth and increasing understanding of the heavenly realities all around us. That's why we should never be surprised that a non-believer cannot fathom, cannot grasp the truth found in Scripture. But for, but for us, 
for those who have been, been believers, chosen by Christ to be his followers, to us has been given this incredible gift that when we read, we understand. That when we see, we say, wow, that's what that meant. And it starts to make sense. And, and perhaps when you're studying the Word of God, sitting under uh, uh, the exposition of the Word, maybe sometimes a light bulb goes on and go, I get it. Oh, I love it when that happens. I get it. I see it. And you know why you see it? Because you're indeed a true disciple, chosen of Christ to follow Him. So, loved ones, isn't it wonderful to know that Jesus does not pick people for his team like the PE captains on, uh, in your PE class chose by popularity, by height, or whatever? What can we bring but, but our shame? But by God's grace, he chose the most insignificant to shame the wise, the weak, the poor. Thank God that he does not choose based on who's the elite or non-elite. And here's the question. As we discovered a little bit by the example of Philip and Nathaniel, what some of the characteristics of, this, uh, of a disciple of Christ, the question is this, are you one? Are you a follower of Christ? Can those characteristics be said of you? Do you realize that you have not chosen Christ but that he chose you? Do you realize the gift that you have in following Christ in that you could understand Scripture, whereas if you were not a follower of Christ, you can read it all day long, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and still not understand it fully? What a joy. What a gift. And I think it's most appropriate as we prepare even now our hearts to, re, to partake of the Lord's Supper. What a wonderful reminder, is it not, beloved, to, to, to remember that it is by God's grace that we've been called to this gift. It is only by God's grace that we could actually partake of the elements and know what they mean. I, I remember, as I'm thinking about it, back when I was lost, when I was a member of the Roman Catholic Church and even, even partaking of communion. How, I just didn't know. But even that, using that as an example to know that as a true disciple of Christ, known by Christ, cannot go to the elements and fully understand what they mean. So as we prepare our hearts now to receive of the elements, I would ask the uh, ushers, the our deacons, to come forward and uh, prepare the table that we may partake of the Lord's Supper. <laughs>